Gospel of John chapter 3. If you didn't bring a Bible, you can feel free to jump on the Wi-Fi, use your wireless device. We also have all the scriptures on the screen. I'll be reading mostly from the New Living Translation today. And I, I, never, I never read this, this much scripture at the beginning of a message, but you kind of need to get the whole, the whole thing here. So John chapter 3, starting in verse 1, there was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. That's all he said. Jesus said, I'll tell you the truth, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said, what do you mean? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus said, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can only produce human life, reproduce human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. He said, the wind blows wherever it wants to. Just as you can hear the wind, but you can't tell where it comes from and where it's going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. And then Nicodemus said, how are these things possible? Jesus said, you're a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't understand these things. I assure you, we tell you what we, what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. And now he's, and now he's laying out the gospel for him. As Moses lifted up the bronze serpent, or the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in Him will have eternal life. For God loved the world so much that He gave His one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent His Son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through Him. There's no judgment against anyone who believes in Him, but anyone who doesn't believe in Him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All those who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it, for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what's right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for giving it to us. Thank you, Lord, for, uh, for sending us your Holy Spirit to rightly divide the word of truth, the whole counsel of God. And I pray that today you would feed us from your bread of life, that you would challenge us from your word, that you would change us to be more like you. And Lord, would you open our hearts to receive and open our eyes to see and our ears to hear what it is your spirit brought us here to say to us. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 So here's a question, and this is the question of the entire series that we're doing. Have you had a personal life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ? That's something that you have to answer for yourself. And here's the question I want to follow up with that. If your answer is no, if you haven't, what's preventing you from seeing him? We're in a series called Breaking Through the Blindness. Breaking Through the Blindness. And as we look at some of the most famous people in the Gospels, we're, learn, we're finding, in each message, we're finding two important truths. One, you will never be a true disciple of Jesus Christ until you have a revelation of Him for yourself. Until you see Jesus for yourself, you'll never be a true disciple of His. And the second truth is this, that very often the, there are things that prevent us. They blind us from having that understanding or having that vision or that revelation of Jesus. So today we want to look at the man that Jesus was talking to when he said the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3.16. Jesus had been talking to this man, Nicodemus, when he laid out this revolutionary truth about who he was and what he'd come to earth to do. 
And that truth was mind-blowing for, uh, for Nicodemus. I mean, it was earth-shattering because he was blinded by a very common problem that many, many of our friends and neighbors have been blinded by as well, especially a bunch of good old Southern Americans. All right? Nicodemus was a member of a group called the Pharisees. And they were, uh, they were a group that had taken the law of Moses and had added really an unreasonable pile of do's and don'ts to it. It was, it was pretty much impossible to keep up with all of the things that they had added to it. So being a Pharisee, Nicodemus probably came to Jesus that night wanting to know what the requirements were for him to get into the kingdom. So Jesus, what are the requirements of the kingdom is probably what was on his mind. He was like the overachiever on the first day of class. You know, the nerd on the first day of class that is eager to get the syllabus so they can start working on the project that ain't due for like three months. So that's what he was. He, he, was, he wanted to know what the expectations were. What are the, the requirements for getting into the kingdom? And Jesus, before he even had a chance to ask the question, Jesus blew his mind right out of the gate. He, he, Jesus said, hey, you got to be born again. you got to be born again. He said, if you're going to get into the kingdom of God, it's an inside-out proposition. It, it happens on the inside first, and then it makes its way to the outside. You, you can't start with the what. You have to start with the who. You all okay? Does that make sense? You can't start with the what are the expectations. You have to start with the who of the kingdom. See, Nicodemus was blinded by the same thing that so many other people are blinded by today, and that's religion. Blinded by religion. You ask a typical Southern person if they love Jesus, and they're going to say, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir, for the most part. And then if you ask them, do you think you're going to make it into heaven? The, the, how do, and if so, why do you think you're going to make it into heaven? They're going to say, well, I, I, I think I do more good than I do bad. And I think Jesus will let me in when he sees me because of that. Y'all have that conversation with people? I just think, I think I've done more good than I've done bad. And I just hope Jesus lets me in when I get there. Or St. Peter, wherever that came from. All right? Listen, those are two completely different things. Two completely different things. People are blinded by religion. So many people are so convinced that they can earn their way to heaven. That they can do enough good to counteract the bad that they've done so naturally in their lives. Listen, that is not how that works. Our only hope of heaven is that we have a real personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that only comes when we see him and his truth for ourselves. Our relationship with Christ is not a religion of doing. It's a religion of being. It's a religion of being, of abiding in Christ and him in us, of being a part of the true vine and, and allowing him to flow through our veins and produce not our fruit, but his fruit. But listen, it starts on the inside first with a relationship with Jesus. Now, how did Nicodemus break through the blindness of religion and have that life-changing encounter with Jesus? And that's what we're here to find out today. So for the first thing is this. He got curious. He got curious. And Nicodemus came to Jesus with something on his mind. He had a purpose for coming. He said, Jesus, we know you're from God because of the miracles that you do. And, and we know that God sent you to teach us some things because nobody else teaches like you do. I've heard a bunch of teachers in my life. Nobody, nobody says things that you say. Nobody says it with the power and the authority that you say it. So Nicodemus started with those two truths. But you can hear that he's kind of trying to put two and two together. You can almost hear his wheels turning in his head because he was curious. He was curious about some things. I, I believe this might be what he was thinking. I, I, he was thinking if he's from God and he came to teach us things, then maybe he knows some things that I don't know. And maybe some of the things that I think I know are not actually true in the first place. I had better go and see him for myself and hear it from his mouth to make sure that I'm actually walking on the path that leads me to the kingdom. And here's what I've found in my life. People rarely find answers to questions they don't ask. 
People rarely find answers to questions they don't ask. Until you get curious about something, you'll never do what it takes to find out. Nicodemus went out to Jesus at night to find out. Now, the traditional assumption is that he went out there at night for political purposes because he didn't want to be seen. It would have been, there would have been political and religious ramifications for him if he, a Pharisee, had been seen with Jesus. So he came under cover of darkness. And that may very well be the case. Or it may be that he just couldn't lay his head down to sleep one more night until he got some of these things settled. You see, there are some things that are worth staying up for. There are some things that are worth staying up and contemplating. There are some things that are worth losing some sleep over. So, listen, I don't really care why he came to Jesus at night. I'm just glad he did. At least the man cared enough to ask. At least he took this seriously enough to to pursue it with Jesus. We need to cultivate curiosity in our lives. So many people either have no relationship with Jesus or they've been stuck in the same place for years. No fresh word, no fresh vision, nothing really going on with them and the Lord, just going through the motions of living what what we in the church call a good Christian life, right? Listen, have you ever stopped to consider that there might be more? That maybe something's missing that maybe God did not did not send His one and only Son to bleed and die so that you could live a humdrum, mediocre, getting by, going through the motions kind of life. Amen. That maybe there's something missing. That maybe He's got a plan for you. That maybe there's a purpose in your life. That maybe He's given you gifts that you're not using. That maybe there's something that he wants you to do for his honor and for his glory. Something that'll get you out of the bed in the morning. Something that'll wake you up and start you on your way. And maybe you're saying, no, John, I've never thought about that in my whole life. Or maybe you're thinking, eh, it's crossed my mind. Listen to me. Aren't you curious? Aren't you a little bit curious? Don't you wonder what it might be like if you saw Jesus for yourself? Why is it that there are so many American Christians, so many cultural Christians, that never get curious about the things of Christ? Just never think about it. I think part of the answer is in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, and I'm reading this from the NIV today. This is from the Beatitudes of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they'll be filled. Hunger and thirst for righteousness because they'll be filled. Listen, maybe the biggest weapon that the enemy has in this world today is busyness busyness. Because if the enemy can keep your schedule full, he can keep your spirit empty. I'm going to say that again in case you were thinking about something else. If the enemy can keep your schedule full, he can keep your spirit empty. Because in order to get full, you have to hunger and thirst How many times have you been so busy you didn't even realize you hadn't eaten? Like you just blow straight through lunch and and you about like four o'clock you're like, I am going to die. And then you realize, I didn't eat. Or maybe you, you you realize you didn't eat, you just didn't have time to stop and eat. If you ain't got time to stop and eat, you too stinking busy. Right? This culture that we live in is so fast-paced, it's so high-stressed, so slam-full that I, I truly believe that many people are not interested in the things of God because they don't have time to get curious about them. We had a family member a few years ago that we, we, we were asking about eternity and, and about heaven, and he, and he just looked flat-footed, just looked at us and said, honestly, I don't think about it. I don't think about it. And before us good Christians go, 
I can't believe that. How many people in churches right now are going to walk out of church and not have another spiritual thought for seven days? So before we start pointing fingers and getting all offended, we need to check ourselves. Isn't that what we do on Sundays? We hit the ground running as soon as I'll shut up and say amen. And and because we don't we don't have time to even get curious about the things of God, to contemplate the things that God showed us in his word or in worship during our time in church. If we're ever going to break through the blindness and see Jesus for ourselves, we're going to have to slow down long enough to get curious. Listen, let your mind wander sometimes. Not like right now. Stop. Hello. Don't let it wander now, but let it wander. I mean, literally stop and smell the roses sometimes. Right? And I want to show it to you in Romans chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. The Apostle Paul said, they know the truth about God. Who's they? Us. Everybody. They know the truth about God because he's made it obvious to them. Really? How's that? For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky through everything God made, including the roses that we drive by and never smell. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Listen, the things of nature were put around us so that we could be reminded on a daily basis of the power and the majesty and the eternal qualities of God. He put it there for us to see, to make us curious about God. But we're so busy, we don't even notice the creation, much less get curious about the Creator. See, religion and busyness go hand in hand. The Pharisees were so busy trying to keep up with all the things they had added to the law of God that they failed to recognize that they weren't connected to the God of the law anymore. Their their religion of busyness was actually keeping them from God. How many times have we been so... Well, I can't can't say that word... Um, I started to say hell-bent, but that's, it's really strange when you're talking about doing your own personal devotion time. You know, like so, so down the rabbit hole, I'm going to read my eight chapters today, bless the Lord. I'm going to read my eight chapters, and I'm going to pray my 12 minutes, or whatever it is, that God's trying to speak to us, like maybe in the third verse that we read, and we push Him aside because we've got to finish our eight chapters. Does that make sense? That, that, that's religion versus relationship. Like it, we're trying to read so we can connect with God, but God's trying to connect with us, but we won't stop reading long enough to listen. Does that make sense? That's blinded by religion. You're like, God, why don't you ever speak to me? I did. <laughs> you wouldn't stop long enough to listen. Right? The thing that's supposed to draw us closer to God sometimes separates us. You're like, good, pastor, I ain't going to read no more. Oh! Isn't there a road between the ditches somewhere? If you're going to break through the blindness of religion, you've got to slow down long enough to get curious about the eternal truths of the Word. Look at Luke chapter 10. Luke 10, verse 36 through 42. Jesus And his disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, and they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. Uh, Martha, meanwhile, was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here How many of y'all would have done the same thing to your sister if Jesus had been sitting in your house? Jesus, isn't it unfair? She's sitting right there while I do all the work. Tell her to come help me. But the Lord said, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset about all these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary discovered it, 
and it won't be taken away from her. Ouch. So are you Mary or are you Martha in the story? See, Martha was so busy doing stuff, she missed what Mary was getting by sitting at the feet of Jesus. Mary was curious to hear what Jesus had to say. When's the last time we came to church curious to hear what God wanted to say to us that day? Like, we didn't have any other agenda. We just like, I'm just going to go to church and hear what God has to say to me today. I know maybe the message is not directed at me, but I believe if I go and I will get myself in the presence of God, He's going to tell me something I need to hear, or He's going to give me something I need to take away. How many more times have we probably come in like Martha? Like, all right, let's get this church thing done because we got to run over here and we got to do that and we got to do that. So let's sing some songs. Like, three's better than five. Let's sing some songs. Maybe raise a hand, say amen a time or two, and then get out of here. Let's go. Aren't we a little curious about what God might have wanted to say to us if we had slowed down? So, so let's go to the other ditch for a second. So John, you're saying we should never do anything for the kingdom of God? No. Stuff has to be done. But you have to make sure that you've spent enough time at the feet of Jesus to make sure you're doing His agenda and not yours. There has to have been a true conversion experience on the inside. That we're healthy and strong on the inside, born again, as Jesus told Nicodemus. Born of the Spirit and not just born of religion. So if you've got questions about God, ask Him. Man, I wish somebody had told me that when I was a kid. you got questions, ask Him. God is not intimidated by your questions. He is not concerned about your doubts. If, you've got a, if you want a revelation of Jesus, you're going to have to get curious enough to ask the questions. Now, if you're brave enough, then your curiosity about the things of God will lead you to the last two steps. Th these are two steps that we don't talk about much in the American church. Um, because we tend to like our religion the way we like our TV shows. Like easy to follow and wrapped up in 30 to 60 minutes. Can I tell you that seeing Jesus is not always going to be that simple? Especially if you're blinded by religion. Because the problem with trying to break through the blindness of religion is not just that you're so busy, but that you've got so much to unlearn. Because your brain is full of stuff that you've learned that, that is either completely wrong or it's misplaced. The emphasis is in the wrong place when compared to the truth of the Word of God. So Nicodemus got curious about the kingdom. Curious enough that he came to talk to Jesus for himself. But once Jesus started spouting truth, then Nicodemus reached the next step very quickly. And the second step is he got confused. He got curious and then he got confused. It's a really difficult step for a religious person. Has anybody besides me had to make that long, difficult journey from religious to relationship? Nobody but me. Oh, good. Okay. Um, there, are, there are places in there that's confusing. Because religious people tend to believe they're right about everything and that they know everything. And Nicodemus, no doubt, went out to meet Jesus with the expectation that he's in pretty good shape. Right? He's thinking... I think I already know the answer, but just in case, I'm going to go make sure I'm good. Right? So he's probably expecting Jesus to say something like, Dude, you're pretty much perfect already. Like, you're right there. I mean, you're, you're nailing it. Good job. And instead, Jesus hit him with a truth bomb about being born again, and confusion came on like a tidal wave. So, like, he thought he was good, and then Jesus said one thing, and he was like, what? So, let me show you again the confusion in, in verses 4 and 9 of this chapter we just read. So, verse 4, Nicodemus said, what do you mean? 
How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Listen, when like a 65-year-old man is contemplating how to get back in the womb, he's confused. Like for real confused. And look at verse 9. Verse 9. He's, how are these things possible? Like he made one suggestion about going back in the womb and that didn't work out at all. So now he's just like, I don't even know. I don't even know. He came to Jesus expecting to get confirmed. <laughs> Instead, he got confused. He got confused. And that's okay. Listen, confusion is part of the journey from religion to revelation. It's part of the journey. It's okay. Confusion is, is, is the state that you're in while the lies that you've believed are being uprooted in your life. It's natural. It, 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 if I can quote Stephen Furtick, it has to happen. It has to happen. You don't, but when it's happening, you don't know where to put your feet. You don't know what's real, what's not. You're, you're, you're confused and you're angry and you're all this stuff. Listen, it's okay. It's okay to be confused about some things. It's okay to be trying to figure it out. You say, but, but I don't, what do I believe if, if I'm confused? Is that not spiritually dangerous? Let me show you 2 Timothy Maybe it'll calm you down. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. This is in the, in the NIV. Paul said, that's why I'm suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame. Please pay attention to this next phrase. For I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced or persuaded that he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him until that day. You can understand the precepts of Jesus all day long. But if you don't have a relationship with the person of Jesus, it won't make any difference in eternity. You have to choose the who over the what. Paul didn't say, for I know what I have believed. He said, I know whom I have believed. Because when you make up your mind to go all in with Jesus, when you've decided that he is the truth, and the way, and the life, then the what's don't really matter. It doesn't matter what he says to you. You've already committed to him, and you're going, you've already committed to doing whatever he says is right and true. So you can be confused about some of the particulars and, your act, and, and, and still have a made-up mind. You can be confused about some, of, some aspect of your faith without losing your faith. As long as you're anchored to the rock, Christ Jesus, you're good. You're good. So quit sweating the details because you're not the theologian that you thought you were. Confusion is okay for a while. See, confusion is also a state of discontent and discomfort. You're like, I'm so uncomfortable in this confusion. You're supposed to be uncomfortable. You're not supposed to move in to the state of confusion. But you do need to pass through it because confusion, confusion will irritate you towards a resolution. Last week we talked about the fact that, that desperation can drive you towards Jesus like it did with the woman with the, issue of, with the issue of blood. Confusion can drive you to Jesus too. But it's, again, it's a pivot point. You have to make a decision. You have to decide whether or not you're going to pursue the truth or whether you're going to remain in the comfort of your religion. Because sometimes when you start to break out and you, get, you break out of your religion and you start finding that there are a lot more questions than answers, at least initially, then you're like, mm, nah, go back in the shell. I'll just act like I never thought that. And you move on. That's not the way, that's not the way you respond. Let me show you the, the way to respond in Acts chapter 17. So that very night the believers sent Paul and Silas to Berea. When they arrived there, they went to the Jewish synagogue, and the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. What does that mean? It means they were curious. They had curious minds towards the things of God, and they listened eagerly to Paul's message. They searched the Scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. As a result, many of the Jews believed, as did many of the prominent Greek men and women and men. When Paul and Silas started teaching things that, were, that ran counter to what they'd always been taught, there was no question they were confused, right? They'd have to be confused. But the Bereans didn't dwell in it. They didn't freak out about it. They didn't wallow in it. They searched the Scriptures for themselves. 
they just, they just dug in and said, man, we hadn't, we hadn't seen those dots connected like that. Let me, let me make sure that lines up with the truth of the Word. I've seen a ton of people over the years come into a Pentecostal church like this one from a mainline denomination, and they hear doctrines that maybe they haven't heard before, or, or they experience things that they don't have context for, and it causes some confusion at first. Y'all remember the first time you went to a Pentecostal church? You're like, what in the world is happening here? Right? And, and for some of you, your first instinct is to run. Just gone. Like, they're going to pull out of snakes anytime, I know. Right? So you're just, you're confused and you don't know because you're seeing and experiencing things. And, and a lot of times what's happening is your spirit is bearing witness to a truth that you've been taught is a lie. And so you're freaking out. You're confused. And listen, if you grew up in a Pentecostal church, I promise you, you learn stuff that you're going to have to unlearn if you're going to get to the truth of the Word. Every, every church has those things with that, that leans more to the religion than the relationship, more, more to the tradition than really the truth. So you have to unlearn some things, and that's okay. It's okay. Dive into the Word and find out what it actually says for yourself. So if you're exploring a relationship with God this morning, like you just showed up and you're like, I don't know about God, I don't know about Jesus, I'm just trying to figure all this out. So if you just showed up and you're exploring and you're hearing some things or you're exper experiencing th some things today that have confused you, get in the Word of God and find out for yourself. Find out for yourself. If people, any people, ever try to teach you something but they don't want you to study it for yourself, and they won't tell you where they got it from, run. Run. Because somebody's trying to deceive you. I'm telling you now, get the Word of God and go find out for yourself. Go see Jesus for yourself. We believe in a God who leads and guides people to all truth through His Holy Spirit, which, by the way, is John chapter 16. In verse 12, when you get serious with God, we believe that God will reveal Himself to you. That you'll see Him for yourself. And just like Jesus did with Nicodemus, He'll help clarify the issues that you're confused about. And then here's the last step, and this takes, this takes a brave person too. It takes a brave person to press on and not dip back out of confusion into your religious shell. He got, he got curious, and then he got confused and then he got confronted. He got confronted. At some point after you're curious enough to ask some questions and you're confused enough to pursue the answers, you're going to get confronted by the truth. You will get confronted by the truth. As a matter of fact, if you are pursuing Jesus, you want to see Jesus for yourself, you will get confronted by the truth because Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. So when you see Jesus, you're going to see the truth. And here's where the rubber meets the road. When you get confronted by the truth, are you humble enough to admit? Are you humble enough to even consider the possibility that you've been wrong? Or will you bend, will you bend the truth to try to make it fit what you want? Too many Christians are looking for a rubber Bible that they can bend and twist and shape and form into whatever they want it to say. And as I was doing some research several years ago about an issue, I love what one theologian said. He said, you can't, the Bible can never say what it never said. It's already been written. You, can't, you don't get editorial privileges because you didn't write it. It's not your book. So are you gonna, when you're confronted by the truth of the Word of God, are you going to consider that maybe it's right and you're wrong? Or are you going to try to make it fit what you already believe? Let me show you what James says about it. James chapter 1. James is a book that will hurt your feelings. Verse 22 says, but don't just listen to God's Word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. Another version says you're deceiving yourself. For if you listen to the Word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in the mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. Since I adopted my new haircut four years ago, I look in the mirror way less than I used to. But you don't need to do that spiritually. Jesus, but Jesus said through James, 
if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. When you see the truth in the mirror of God's Word, confronted by the truth, are you going to do something about it? Or are you going to walk away and forget it? Are, are you going to be, confronted, to be confronted and conformed? Or are you just going to ignore the truth that's right there in black and white? You see, religion will try to keep you locked into what you've always done, what you've always known, keep you in your little protective shell, protected from the truth, locked, really, locked away from the truth, locked into a form of godliness. But the power of godliness is not in the outward appearance of it, it's in the source of it, and that's Jesus. So none of the good things that any of us have ever done in this life make any difference. They're not going to matter unless we're in right relationship with Jesus. Let me give you an example from the Word. Paul, the apostle, was incredibly influential in his old religious life. He was good at it. He was religious and good at it. He was passionate. He was committed. He was loyal. He was fearless. He was willing to sacrifice. He was faithful. He gave his tithe. He gave alms to the poor. He did all of that stuff. But he got confronted by the truth, literally blinded by the light of the truth on his way to a city called Damascus. And this is how he views that decision. This is what Paul said about having to give up his old life and pursuing new life with Jesus. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7, he said, I once thought that these things, his old life, were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with Him. In verse 9, I no longer count my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with Himself depends on faith. Paul got confronted with the truth, and he was willing to give up everything to obtain the truth, to live by the truth, to live for the truth, and to die for the truth. The truth is that valuable to him. Why is that? Because Jesus said when you know the truth, it makes you free. It makes you free. Free from the lies of religion. Free from the chaos that's brought on by busyness. Free from the, free, free from the burden of having to earn your way into heaven trying to make sure you're balancing the scales of good and bad. Free from having to stand before the Lord one day and admit that you barely scratched the surface of what He had in store for you because you were too blinded by religion to see it. So let me ask you this this morning. Same question I asked you to begin with. Have you had a personal, life-changing encounter with the Jesus of the Bible. Listen, not the Jesus of the culture, not the Jesus of tradition, not the Jesus, even the Jesus of the church, but the Jesus of this Word, the the Jesus that revealed Himself in this Word. Or have you been blinded by religion? Let me encourage you today. Start on a path that will break you through the blindness of religion or anything else that might be binding you. So if you've never really thought about it, you just assumed, oh, I'm I'm sure I'm I'm good. I mean, I'm sure God will let me in or whatever. Get curious enough to know what the truth is. Don't you want to know the answers before the test? If you've got a sneaking suspicion that there are some false beliefs kind of lurking around in your heart that maybe you learned from somewhere else, Be brave enough to get confused and then let that confusion drive you to learn the truth and see Jesus for yourself. And if you already know that there are some things that are not quite right in your life, some things that you're not believing right, then allow yourself to get confronted by the truth and then get conformed to the truth 
instead of trying to make it what you want it to be. 